It's everybody's favorite time of year. It's time to do arithmetic. Welcome to Math Rewatch. I'm Andrew Fan Math Watch. Oh man, and I'm Ryan J. Mathlete, and here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is an, always an exciting time of year for us uh, to always in the Infinity Rewatch uh, do our seasonal rankings of the That's MCU. Right. We're ranking now this, now this one is interesting because this time we've added a Disney Plus list. Yes, we have. Because this time last year, it was kind of slim pickings, right? We had like three shows. So it didn't really yeah. make a whole lot of sense. But this year... There was a lot to work with, so we thought we would throw it up on there. Uh, throw it up sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like we're sick. Let's let me rephrase oh. that. that. We thought we would add it up onto the marquee of Marvel stories. So the way we do rankings here, it's our, our patented Rebel Scum Podcast Network ranking formula uh, because it's always fun to use cold, hard math and science when we talk about art and fun and things that we like. Uh, so the ranking system works like this, is a bunch of people got asked, hey, rank all the movies and on a separate list, rank all the Disney Plus shows um, based on you know your least favorite to your most favorite. And uh, the number that you assign it, so let's say, okay, there are 30 movies, right? Uh, so let's say you put, for whatever reason, you put Iron Man 1 as your least favorite. So Iron Man 1 would be number 30 on your list. That's that's blasphemy. It is blasphemy. No just... only, only four people ranked it that low, thankfully. Uh, <laughs> no, that didn't happen. Um, but if you ranked it at the bottom of your list, it would get 30 points because it's number 30 on your list. And then at the end, once I've gotten everybody's lists, I tally up how many points every movie has gotten. And just like in the wonderful world of golf, the less points, the better. Um, so before... We get into it. I think we'll start with the Disney Plus list. But before we get into it, Ryan, I want to try to get some predictions out of you because we like betting on things. So <laughs> I'm going to write a little something here. Ryan's bets. So for Disney Plus, Ryan, uh -huh. um, there were nine shows to work with. I actually did not include What If or I Am Groot because they are so different and they are so outside of the canon box that I just felt like they weren't going to get a fair shot. Nobody was going to be like, yeah, I am Groot's my favorite, right? So I was like, <laughs> let's just leave them off the table and focus on the nine live action shows. So fun be, fact, fun yeah. fact, actually, I actually have not seen to date I am Groot. I have not watched it. Me neither. I, I don't think <laughs> you're alone. I'm pretty sure the people yeah. who made I am Groot haven't even seen I am Groot. <laughs> so that's why I didn't want to, it's, it's kind of like, you know, putting I am Groot on this list would be like, asking me to play at the FIFA World Cup. It's like, that team is going to lose. Let's yeah. just, <laughs> let's just let, let the professionals do their thing. So <clears throat> we have nine shows, Ryan. And I want you nine to try shows. to guess. Um, so how, how do I phrase this mathematically? I asked seven people. That's what I need to start with. Seven people were polled and gave me lists. Mm -hmm. So because there were nine shows, um, if you came in last place and you got nine points, actually, sorry, let me let me get that. Forget that. That's too much math. <laughs> start again. Start again. Let me start again. Because I asked seven people, the the lowest number you could get is seven. That's if every person put you as number one. So for the Disney Plus list, Ryan, I'd like you to try to guess how many points the number one show has, with seven being the minimum amount of points it could get seven being the minimum how many points did the highest one get yeah i uh, uh um I'm the high the oh, wait. i'm trying i'm still trying to capture this this web of math that you've created i know i'm so sorry <laughs> so wait seven is the max points someone can give the show no seven is the lowest number of the points lowest. a show can get so okay because seven is the number of people i asked that's right right, right 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 okay so i'm gonna say i'm gonna say i think 50 is a good number so i'm gonna say 50. you think 50 wow yeah. um i have a feeling one movie is i or sorry one disney plus show is gonna be like number one i have a prediction for what my number one i think is uh-huh 
Well, I'll tell you right now, 50 is, is very high. Even the show that got the most points, which is bad, got yeah. less than 50 points. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So take another guess. Mm, okay. I'm going to say 30. 35. 35. 35. Okay. You guessed that the, the show with the least points, which means it's good. Remember, less points is better. You guessed the show with the least points is going to have 35 points. All right, let's see if you were right. So here we go. We're ranking the Disney Plus shows based on the seven people we pulled. And every year, hopefully, we get to pull more and more people uh, over on ranking Star Wars. I think James said that they pulled like over 40 people. Wow. Um, I don't know what those lists are going to look like. All I know is, as usual, Attack of the Clones is going to be way lower than it has any right to be. <laughs> That should be the number two Star Wars movie of all time, but I I, guess. I I love Attack of the Clones. I don't know why more people don't love it. Yeah, I don't understand, Ryan. We're living in a strange world. Uh, yeah, they, they be strange times. <laughs> all right, here we go. The lowest scoring show, number nine. Collectively, once we tallied up all the math, the least popular show on Disney Plus with 44 points is... You want to guess what it is? <sighs> Is it She-Hulk? Because <laughs> I, I, no, no, hold on. I'm going to take this seriously. That was a great guess. Really? But it was Should wrong. <laughs> it was not oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Are you Monty Hauling me right now? <laughs> I think I am. Uh, yeah, no, okay. It's, okay, I was wrong. All right, let's say my guess was She-Hulk. Well, with 44 points, that is not She-Hulk. It is the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Ooh, that kind of hurts a little bit, but uh, it stinks. But I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm not. I'm not surprised. Falcon Winter Soldier. People had a lot of expectations for that show, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, those expectations did not come through. So that's totally understandable. Yeah, it's. It was my bottom show for a long time, and honestly, I can't remember where I ranked it when I did my final rankings. Mm -hmm. um, in the middle of the watch that I'm doing with my mom right now, because I'm showing her everything. We are actually on Falcon and Winter Soldier, but we're only two episodes in. So I haven't gotten back to the end and I haven't gotten a chance to take a second look at it and be like, did I like this the least? Like what's good about it? What's not good about it? Uh, so I did have it low and it's understandable. You know, it was, uh, I guess it was just kind of not what everybody wanted to see. I really can't sum it up but it is not a bad show we just had better shows than this right if yeah, this is the yeah. worst that the disney plus marvel shows get ryan i think we're in good hands i mean this is definitely looking to be an interesting list now if falcon if falcon was the bottom so that's that's already a good start <laughs> right so we're doing okay next one up with 42 points she hulk attorney at law yeah, I, I could take that. I that's a hit for me. That's two hits for me already. But I I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, it's a shame. It's a shame. I think that show was was a good, healthy balance of good character development and uh, and just fun. You know, just kind of like why it's it's one of those shows where why doesn't why does the MCU have to have major consequences? Where it's like why can't we just focus on a character and just see their like development and growth? Right. That's what it's about. It's about a single character developing. It's not about shaking up the world. It's not about, oh my God, now there's a man in the ocean or, oh my God, now vibranium is everywhere. It's just about a lady who's green trying to get by. Um, it flip-flopped a lot for me where it fell on my list. Like there were some points where She-Hulk was my favorite show and then there were some points where it was much, much mm -hmm. lower. But I think it deserves to be a little higher than this myself. Um, but that's that's where she all stands at 42 points. What are you gonna do? Uh, all right, next up with 41 points, so just beating out she Hulk. Uh, we actually had two shows that got 41 points, and when we have a tie, what happens is I look at what everybody gave the tied shows, and I look at what was the highest it ever got ranked and the lowest it ever got ranked, and then I kind of consolidate from there. So even though this was a tie, the next one by tie-breaking rules is the Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special. So, so okay, so it's still pretty much the bottom of the list here. Um, 
this would be this is us exiting the bottom of the list into the middle but yeah mm -hmm. i'm not again guardians galaxy it was fun it was fun but overall to me um certain things played on way too long and things that should have been longer were not and uh overall i mean there's some real gem moments in that that special presentation there are there really are some gems the whole mantis thing it's beautiful Mantis um, crushed it. Mantis crushed that whole thing. She led. She led that thing. So, uh, if it is the first of many holiday specials to come, I think, in hindsight, we're going to look back on it in a different light. Uh, and I think I'll, we're going to say that a lot during this list, Ryan. I think a lot of this list has the Marty McFly uh, at the Enchantment Under the Sea dance effect of. I guess you guys weren't ready for that yet, but your kids are going to love it, right? Yeah. Uh, so. Guardians Holiday, I get it. Maybe if there was less singing and more plot, it might have fallen higher on a lot of people's lists. But hey, one person had it number one. James had it number one because James loves Guardians and he loves Christmas. It was no, literally gift fair. wrapped for him. Um, good call, James. Good call. Yeah, good call. Great special. Just it fell where it fell. And it was so close to beating the next one on the list because they were tied. It was a matter of just a, like a fraction of a point. Miss Marvel is the next one with 41 points. That's fair. That's mm. fair. I, you know, I've had some good talks about Miss Marvel, and all I will say is is that it's it's definitely catered to a certain type of audience, and uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's going to it's gonna attract a lot of younger younger generations to the Marvel brand, and I think that's what it serves. And it's really, it's in my opinion, it's really good for it. Um, I still enjoyed it. I still love the culture it exposed me to. Um, but yeah, it definitely kind of was more of a, uh, a Disney Marvel experience. I would say with Miss Marvel, I, I wish I could remember where I put it on my list. It started off real high like She-Hulk and then it slowly started going down as I thought about it because even though I was having so much fun watching it and I love the character mm -hmm. and the world they made, I feel like at the end of the day, I wanted them to pick a lane and that lane was either the Jin storyline or the damage control storyline and they tried to straddle both, and they both kind of came off anticlimactic. Do you agree? Yeah. Do you feel like that was a big roadblock for them? 100%. Because, and it, it still fits in what, with what I'm trying to say. It's because it's it, it was a really fun way to look at her, the character. Um, and, like, I love, like, all the, the little kind of things to relate to in today's world, like the social media stuff, you know, her imagination coming to life. Um, but, yeah, in terms of, like... MCU development, it was really hard to follow where the show was going. And I, I still don't understand what it means or where it's going. Like, I have a feeling that the Jin eventually will be revealed as the Inhumans. And it's just kind of like they're the nameless, they're nameless right now until they need to be named and have like a big presence. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, which is both cool, but at the same time, eh, I don't know. It just kind of like, I feel like if that's true, then you should, could have just ended it on that note and everyone would have had a whoa moment or like something i don't know something yeah there's two great stories in that show and instead of telling them both at once they should have just dedicated more time to one i don't know i it's it's tricky because i really do love that show it's, it's yeah just... i mean i love the character i think she's an amazing like i think i can't wait to see her actually mingle with other characters i think that's going to be a real benefit for her. that's going to be a lot of fun and if, unfortunately i don't know if you read this but apparently the guy who plays her dad um, got arrested and he's no longer coming back for season two. Um, oh, no. Yeah, it was. I, I, I read this. I don't know if it's true. This is purely allegedly. But apparently the actor who plays her father, and I loved that character, uh, was, uh, you know, doing some bad things with minors and uh, rightfully so got arrested for it. So, yeah, that's a that's a big scratch on the side of this show's cheek that uh, it's unfortunate. Um but I, I want more of this world. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we play in this world in a deeper way the next time we visit her. Exactly. Exactly. So that was Miss Marvel. Next up, beating it by only one point with 40 points, Ryan. This is going to hurt you. Moon Knight. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. So, okay. This, what, what number is this? Five? Yeah, this is number five. We're in the top five shows now. Top five. So it made top five, which yeah. I'm, I, I'm okay with. That's a passing grade for me. Um, I'm surprised it didn't rank a little higher. I think it's, it, 
I think what's what's clever is the comic book little influences sprinkled throughout it, um, especially the scene where you actually see like his origin. Uh, I think that was probably one of the coolest ways to do an origin story without doing an entire origin story. It's literally you go to a flashback moment where, which I predicted, by the way, I totally mm. predicted that that was going to happen. And, uh, and they name drop Bushman, uh, which is like the key character that like turns him into Moon Knight, essentially. Um, aside from Khonshu, I mean. Uh, and yeah, they like they hit all the notes. You know, the uh, famous architect dies, uh, you know, at the hands of Bushman and uh, Mark Spector tries to stop him. And then he's left for dead in the desert by the statue, becomes Moon Knight. And it's it's perfect. And, and, and it's, you know, it's like fast forward, you know, however many years. And it's fun. I actually just finished Moon Knight. Uh, I'm doing a rewatch myself. I can't remember how many rewatches this has been for me, but uh, to get this far. 17. Just- 17 uh give or take 20 uh you know uh but yeah it was uh, i had a lot of fun watching moon knight it's i'm a little surprised it didn't rank a little higher because it is very different it's also very violent um but um yeah it it is what i think it's a i think it's a promising experiment is what moon knight is probably the most apt description for moon knight i like that a promising experiment that's really cool um when i was ranking moon knight I was trying to remember, I'm like, okay, what did I love about Moon Knight? And you know, why, where should I rank it based on that? And what kept coming to me was that the plot of him, you know, whatever he was doing with, uh, with Scarlet Scarab and with Khonshu and where, you know, all that stuff with Harrow, all of that feels like it, it just kind of went in one ear and out the other for me. Mm-hmm. What I loved about Moon Knight was what you're saying, the origin, the really unique way that they dipped into his subconscious and explained who Mark Spector is, who Steven is and where that personality came from and the thing with his mother and all that past, that was beautiful. That was what I took away from Moon Knight and made me say like, wow, this is a great show. There's a lot of potential here. Uh, And that's what made it different to me because most of these superhero movies uh, and shows, the plot is the thing, but this was the most character study-ish of the bunch. Uh, so it it took a bit of time for me to understand that that was what I appreciated about it. So I ranked it kind of middling because mm-hmm. I I feel like I just wish the plot was a bit more something I could, you know, focus on and latch onto. Mm-hmm. But I love what they did with the character. So that's why Moon Knight fell where it fell, Ryan. It fell in number five spot. And that was with 40 points. And now you're going to see a huge gap because the next show, number four, had 32 points. So it's eight <laughs> points better. Now we're starting to see a lot more people swinging on one side of the coin here. And that show is, you want to take a guess what came in number four? One division. That is an incorrect guess. Uh... <laughs> you had the right letter, though. The answer is Werewolf by Night. Ah, okay. Wow. Werewolf by Night ranked a little higher than I anticipated. That's really interesting. Yeah, a lot of I don't think I know a single person who was like, you know what? I didn't care for Werewolf by Night. I'm sure Twitter is full of them, but thankfully I don't know any of those unpleasant people. So Werewolf by Night fell in a nice spot here. All I'm gonna say is another promising experiment, but with with amazing results is is what yes. it is. Yes. Um it was you know, in, in comic book vernacular, it was a one shot, just like the Guardians holiday special. Um, however, the Guardian special was one of those one shots that shows your characters doing something that's just sort of small and fun. Whereas this is the kind of one shot that almost acts as a prologue to a new comic book ongoing coming out, right? Mm. Uh, it's kind of like an issue zero. You know how comics do that? It's like, hey, here's Green Lantern issue zero. And guess what? Jeff yeah. Johns is relaunching Green Lantern now. That's what that felt like. And as you so beautifully put it when we talked about it, it's opening up the doors into the supernatural world and promising in its own way without actually shoving them in our faces, promising things like Blade, things like Lilith, things you know like the Dark Dimension and all that fun supernatural stuff that is on the horizon. Absolutely. So good spot for it. Number four, 
with 32 points. Now at number three, with 31 points, close call here, Hawkeye. Oh, Ooh. Hawkeye. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think I think Big Willie was a big factor in that for everybody. <laughs> mm. I mean, we get him for we get him for one episode, but it's a good it's a good damn episode. It's a great episode, and like not only Big Willie, but Yelena's cameo is fantastic, and then of course the new character of Kate Bishop is wonderful. Swordsman is wonderful, right? It's there's so much happening here, and it's such a cozy, beautiful uh, Christmas show. It's beautiful to look at. Uh, yeah. there's very little not to love about Hawkeye. Absolutely. I, I, Hawkeye is a right balance of a fun show, but lots of really good, just lots of really good development. And and not only in the MCU, but in the characters and so many character introductions, actually, because you have Echo, you have Swordsman, you have uh, Kingpin, you have Kate Bishop. You I have, totally forgot uh, about Echo. You're right. Echo's another yeah. great addition. Yeah. And Echo made a big wave when she came in. Like once her character really kind of, you know, she had her episode, it was really awesome. It was really fun. Um, and um, you get Return of Hawkeye in like traditional Hawkeye outfit. You mm -hmm. got the uh, introduction of the trench or the, sorry, the, oh my God, the mafia. What are they called? The, the tracksuit uh, mafia. The tracksuit mafia. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, so there's so many good comic book influences here. It's a fun story. Uh, the Hawkeye having the Ant-Man bow, like there's so many things, uh, or sorry, the Ant-Man arrow. Uh, there's so many things and it's, it's so fun. It is so lucky. The dog, even lucky, the dog's a big comic book yeah. character and he was in it. So it was just cool to see. It was great to have. And, um, I just think, yeah, I think it's, I think honestly, that's a solid formula for a show. It, I think it is personally. It really is. It's got a lot of stuff that they packed in those six episodes. I ranked it really high myself. I think it was my number two pick. So I'm happy that it landed where it landed. Now we've only got two left. Now, Ryan, you guessed that the number one show would have 35 points. You're a little bit off the mark, my friend. Yeah. The, the number two show has 30 points. Uh, okay. And that is your boy Loki. Really? Loki yeah. was not number one. Oh my <laughs> god. I'm a little surprised. I'm a little surprised. Loki got 30 points. Um this is this is a biased list though. I think you just like played with the math so one division would be number one. I did. I I used, <laughs> I used my skull duggery. I basically That's... put a gun to people's heads and I was like, hey, you know what? It'd be a shame if something were to happen. Hmm? Uh yeah. <laughs> All right, Loki. I'm I'm really surprised. Um, Loki, man, pr pretty much broke the internet. Uh, but again, another good formula that other shows could easily adopt and and really have fun with. Um, yeah, and Kang. Oh my God, that was such a that last episode. Just oof, amazing. <laughs> this was your number one show, right? Yeah, I chose as my number one because I felt that there was really good theming. Um, and I felt that I felt it just goes to show how you can reinvigorate a character um, because, you know, we had fun with Loki and, and, you know, Loki has a complete journey in, in all the movies he was in um, from all the way to, up until Ragnarok. And then, uh, and then you think, okay, you know, end game, they finally get him, and it's like, okay, that's it. Loki's done. And, and even as a story wise, like you could you literally, you could, you know, put him away and that would be it. But for him to be thrown back into the fold and, and then you're like, okay, well, this is a different Loki. So clearly how are, how are we, the audience and Loki going to catch up to where everything's at? Because you can't just start from scratch again and expect people to could be like, well, I miss my Loki. Um, and not only that, they do such an incredible job and they explain so many incredible little details that you didn't even know you wanted. Um, my favorite, one of my favorite scenes is the first episode when, when Owen catches up with them after he fake fake escapes. Um, and, um, and he's sitting there and he's just, and you know, he looks, the, and this is, this goes back to, and I'll be really short here, but like, this goes back to. You know how do you show the how do you show the consequent the gravity of consequences from Endgame, 
And, you know, you remember Loki from the first Avengers movie. He has the cube. He almost, like, you know, rules the world, essentially. Um, and and then all the way till Endgame where he makes a big sacrifice play and, like, you know, Endgame happens. And you see him sitting there with the cube. And it's they treat it like a paperweight. And it, it literally means nothing. And, and it's the TVA. And that is so huge and so monumental. It's It's perfect. It's perfect. The world of the TVA is such a cool world to explore. Uh, and Mobius was probably the breakout Marvel character of 2021. Like he was yeah. just so much fun. I think this is another case of a show that people are going to rank higher as it goes on. Because I feel like once we get season two, there's going to be more of it to love and more of it to hold up. I think I had it in like fourth place or something like that. Um, I feel like all the TVA stuff really sang to me. Mm -hmm. And then when they got to, I can't remember what it's called, but the world where Kang was uh, with the cloud monster, I feel like a lot of it kind of fell flat there for me until Kang showed up and they had that beautiful discussion with them. So that to me really dropped it because I felt like that was a final episode that needed uh, a bit more meat to it than that world gave us. Like, yes, seeing a, an alligator Loki is fun, but it felt like that there was were great. no... It was great, but it felt like there were no stakes on that world until Kang showed up. Um, so I I love what it was setting up, and we know there's more to come. So I feel like it's going to... It's very likely this show might end up number one next time we do this, because we'll have a second season under our belt to judge. I don't think that second season is going to be bad, so I doubt it'll be any lower. Uh, but I think this is a good spot for Loki, number two, with 30 okay. points. Now, WandaVision is obviously number one, and it won by a landslide because Loki got 30 points. WandaVision got 14 points. Wow. And as far as I'm concerned, that's still too many points because this show is absolutely wonderful. Uh, this is a, this should have gotten seven points. This is just that all around the show that Marvel needed to kick off their Disney plus shows. It's still, like I said, the most incredible visual representation of any superheroes powers I have ever seen on the big or small screen. It told the most emotional story um, it followed up the, the fallout of Endgame very well. And aside from She-Hulk, I think it's the only show on this list that takes advantage of the lack of limitations a Disney Plus series can have. So it ticks off every box as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there, was, mm -hmm. there was no question for me that WandaVision was going to be number one. When I was making the list, it was basically like, okay, what are numbers two through nine? Because I already know number one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it, WandaVision was, was probably, I, I, I like that they chose WandaVision first as their first kind of Disney plus show because it offered so much on so many different levels. You have a great superhero story and then you have the sword story on top of that. And then you have new characters introduced on top of that. And just, it's just so many layers and what I like about it is what it's what it has the possibility of setting up. You know what I mean? Um, not only did it did we get to see some small payout of setups um, with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, right? We get to see now Wanda from as, as a result from WandaVision and what 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 it can do, um, which is which is also proves this was one of the shows that actually proved that. Um, you you need to watch a Disney Plus show in order to see what's going to happen to a character, right. which is really fun to see. I I actually want to see more of that. I want to see vice versa. What happens after a movie event to a character, which we might see with like something like Ironheart, for example. That's a great um, point, though, buddy. Sorry to interrupt you. That's a great point you bring up. Of all the shows on this list, that one has affected the movies the most. Yeah. Absolutely, it totally affected the movies the most, and and 
oh man like and for Rami uh, Sam Rami to do it and and see how like twisted she can get like for what she wants is is just it's really dark um but I loved it um and yeah I mean definitely I'd say that's my, one probably the biggest reason why it deserves to be where it is is because of the synergy it has with the movies yeah and I hope moving forward we see even more of that synergy because it really um I, I I would love to talk to somebody who watched Multiverse of Madness without watching WandaVision and get their reaction to like what happened with Scarlet Witch and why she was doing what she was doing and if any of that made sense. Well well, based on that fact alone, let's let's look at the math here, right? The math or let's look at the facts here. The facts here is is that Endgame leaves you with her actually building a relationship. Right. Yeah. And and she builds a relationship with Vision to which he sacrifices himself. The next time we see her is not until really Doctor Strange and Multiverse Madness. Um to which she talks about, you know, uh or she has the visions of kids and stuff. So clearly you kinda there's a lot of imagination that plays into that, but yeah, you're right. Like I would I would be interested to see someone's reaction to that. Yeah, I'm so curious. I don't know anybody who, you know, skipped the show but went to the movie, but there's got to be somebody out there, somebody just like a person at the back of the theater, a casual fan, and I wonder what they had to say, because it was so tied in to the point where when in the movie, when Wanda has her, she goes into the, the parallel world where she has the two kids, it's the same set that they use for WandaVision. It's the same house and living room and staircase and everything. So they are... Uh, a, a piece they are one and the same and you kind of need one to have the other and mm -hmm. that's the kind of synergy that I didn't even think of but you brought it up and you're absolutely right man that is multimedia working at its finest uh, that's something that a lot of Star Wars fans will tell you they want to see more of so the mm -hmm. fact that Marvel did that I, I, I hope they do that more let's see you know hopefully in the Blade imagine the Blade movie we see that the mansion the bloodstone mansion with that room with all the heads on the wall all the monsters right that would be so cool so that's the kind of you know cross-platform stuff that we love and hopefully wandavision has set a bar for that so congrats wandavision you are very very deserving of the number one spot on mm -hmm. that list by this time next year ryan how many other shows will we have to add to this we'll have secret invasion we'll have iron heart that's mm -hmm. next year, right? Ironheart's next year? Yeah, next year is Ironheart. What am I missing? Loki season two doesn't count because it's still Loki. So obviously that'll yeah. be... Uh, uh, is it? Is Agatha next year? The Covenant of Chaos? Yeah. No. Uh, no, I don't think so. Mm. Uh, that would be... I think it's... I, also, I don't think Daredevil's not till the following year either. Right, yeah. Daredevil's still a ways away. Mm -hmm. no, I don't think it's only those two shows. There's got to be one more. What are we missing? See? I know, oh, I know um, they're reducing. They're reducing they are, a little. They are reducing. Maybe it's just Secret Invasion and Ironheart. Mm, no, there's one more forgetting. I'm trying to find it right now. Uh, do, 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 do. I love mm -hmm. it. If you ever look up like the phase lineup images, uh, the images, man, people are just all over the place. Everyone's got their predictions. Oh, Thunderbolts. Oh, that's a movie. Uh, Thunder oh, the Thunderbolts is a movie, huh? Yeah. Okay, so we got Quantumania, Secret Invasion, Guardians of the Galaxy, Echo. Echo, that's the one. That's the one. Thank yeah. you. Um, that one's probably gonna end up being really, really high on my yeah. list. So. And it, the uh, Blade was gonna be a movie, right? Yes. Okay, so well, Blade. I think Blade got pushed back though. I think it did because it lost the director, so it needed some more time. Yeah. So um, yeah, we lost Blade. So we're gonna have Secret Invasion, Echo, Loki, and then Ironheart, and Ironheart. that's it. That's a decent lineup. That's a good year. Mm -hmm. uh, that that covers it's, a lot of of the mm -hmm. the sections of Marvel. There's street level. There's uh, magic. All kinds of stuff. There's, it's all good. They say Agatha is winter 2023-24. Okay, so, so like this time next year, going into the new year. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this technically, if Agatha doesn't come out, we have one, two, three, four, four yeah. shows. That's a decent amount to add to this. I heard today um, 
um, I think, I don't know if it's news or not, but Aubrey Plaza has apparently been cast in Agatha. And I got yeah. a big old crush on her. So that's very <laughs> exciting. She is lovely. Mm -hmm. she, I, her sense of humor is, is miles ahead of mine. <laughs> but she's, uh, she's a fun person for sure. Yeah. All right. So those are the shows, right? Uh, now good we've list. got. It was a good list. Very, it is. Few good. few good surprises in there. I like that. I like when we have the little shakeups and things like that. So now we got thirty movies, and once again, I will ask you to predict, Ryan, uh, if the lowest number you can get, the lowest score, which is good, if the lowest score you can get is seven, what do you think the number one movie got? Well, now that I have a better grip on it. Um... So let's see. Loki was thirty, and then now, uh, granted, one... th there were only nine shows to work with, and there were thirty movies, so it was much more to juggle. Mm -hmm. So WandaVision got fourteen, but that's that's a tall order for the movies to get fourteen. I'm gonna say the top movie is going to have something like ten, somewhere around like ten or twelve. Ten or twelve. All right. I am pretty convinced that one movie is going to stand out, stand out pretty pretty big. Okay, I'll lock that bet in. Here we go. The bottom of our list, number thirty. I gotta admit, this I find this a little bit disappointing that this one ended up at the bottom. Uh, just to give you guys an idea here, let's see if uh, if the most you can give them. Let me just do some quick math here. The highest score you could get, which is bad. Is two hundred and ten points. That's if oh if every God. if everybody ranks you last, you would get yeah. two hundred and ten points. I think I have some predictions already. On <laughs> Thankfully, this movie did not get two hundred and ten, but it still got way too many points. As far as I'm concerned, it got one hundred and eighty-two. What movie? What movie do you think it is? Eternals. It's exactly what it is. It's Eternals. <laughs> I am not surprised. I am not by any means surprised. I'm it's very shame. disappointed. It's, it's a shame. It's it's a shame on a business standpoint because they actually got an Oscar award winning director. And and if she succeeded, that would have meant a lot for Marvel to be taken a little more seriously. Um but it's she but to be fair, she took on a really tough group. Like, I think they were hoping for a Guardians kind of thing. Like, let's take a very unknown BC level group and make them as famous as Guardians. And it just didn't work. It didn't. They pulled the wrong, the wrong characters. I don't think they should have focused on the Eternals, personally. I think they should have focused on Cersei and the Black Knight. And you could have built out some Avengers story in there and then, you know, weave the Eternals in there and build up a bit, bit to the Eternals. But it's too much. It was just too much, and the story was too long, and there was too way too many things going on that you just didn't care about. There's, there's not. They, it didn't earn. It didn't earn your attention. And I felt like the fact that there was a lot going on to me that was a good thing. Um, after the events of Endgame, I wanted something, even though we were setting up the bowling pins again like we talked about phase four is all about resetting and showing the world uh it was nice to get a giant epic in there mm -hmm. and it's funny because it, it's such a whirlwind because people are people who hate on phase four like to say it's you know it's a step down from endgame and you know we've had to keep saying on this podcast like you can't go from endgame to another endgame you have to start small again and build up absolutely and, and yet when they did try to release a giant epic with a lot of characters, those same people who hated Phase 4 said, this is the worst part of Phase 4. So it's like, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Personally, I think it's it's not my favorite Phase 4 movie, but it's not my least favorite either. I kind of had it right in the middle in terms of all my Phase 4 things. You I ranked it in the middle? Not oh, in the yeah. middle Not you're... in the middle of my whole list. Uh, oh, okay. Actually, I'll tell you exactly where I ranked it. because I did not... Are you saying you ranked it in the middle of your bo the bottom end of your list? In the middle of my phase four list. Oh, in the phase four. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. I had it. Uh, I had it at number 20 out of 30 on my list. I had it. Wow. 
Yeah, pretty pretty far up there because I really liked the world building they did. I think all the cosmics, this is the most cosmic world building we've ever gotten. The Guardian stuff was beautiful, sure, uh, but it was so just so separate from everything. This is the, the most we've ever seen the cosmic interact with the Avengers level world and Captain Marvel's world building was just not there for me. So I love what they, how they integrated it. They finally put it all together and gave us the promise that it was an important part of the saga. And we know these people are going to be peppered all throughout now this story. And it's only a matter of time that we see them again. And I'm really, I'm really disappointed that it didn't work out that way. And I'm still pulling Ryan for an Eternals 2. I'm still pulling, or at least just, mm. you know, having them be the garnish in all the other dishes that we get, because I really liked these characters and I like how they integrated them into the world. And I want to see more of that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, it's, a fair point. I I don't know. I don't know what could have fixed it. To be honest with you, that would yeah. convince not only myself that, but others, other fans for sure. That I just don't know what you could have done to make that better. It's it's such a weird pick. It it, it is such a weird. Maybe should have started with Star Fox and like talk about, um, you know the the brother the relationship between him and Thanos, and then try to figure out how that na- how to navigate that, but. I don't know. Eternals was just such a such a big undertaking, and I'm I'm so so upset for Chloe because I wanted it to work out. Yeah. I wanted it to. I wanted I wanted it to work out and have an Oscar award winning director get like big up props for like you know elevating the Marvel franchise into kind of that Hollywood status of of like the Oscars. Just you know, just kind of even the playing field a little bit. If it never happens, I'm okay with that too. But like, just I feel like there's 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 they deserve some a little bit more. They deserve a little bit more. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it's a very weird movie. And I also agree that I don't know what they could have done to make it more appealing to people. Mm. Maybe it needed to be shorter. Maybe it needed to be longer. Maybe we needed more of these characters to understand why their story is important. I don't know. A smarter person than me needs to figure that out. But what they gave me was beautiful. And while imperfect, I feel like it's it's important to the franchise. It's going to be. You know, the one thing I will say is it was a big ensemble cast. Like, the Eternals yeah. is a big, big group. Like, we're talking Avengers-level size, and these are all characters we know nothing, very little about. And they wanted to give equal char- all the characters equal kind of spotlights and, like, understanding of who they are. Even though Makari, I think, is, like, one of the least – the one with the least background in terms of like the story development. Um, I think that the ensemble cast should have included not all the Eternals, but like have, have all the Eternals, but not all of them have a story to play out as much. Cause it's like, okay, now we are learning about this character and uh, we're learning about Athena and she's broken and she's like, you know, this warrior, great warrior. And then we're looking into a uh, Druid and he can control all these minds, but yet the only, you know, the people can't control his mind and he's very mistrusting. And then we have Congo and you know what I mean? Like, it's like everyone, everyone character has a story and a reason, but it's not like the X-Men where the X-Men, each character offers such a different story and that's worth so much investing. Like, you know, you look into Rogue and then Rogue gives you so much background and story. You look into Gambit, Gambit's story and how it evolves with the, you know, with an Eternal, um, you know, and, you know, this whole uh, dive or whatever they call it thing. And, you know, Cyclops, like everyone has a very different background, but here they all have a common thing that makes them common, but it's just like you're, it's like you're opening a psychological profile on each one and it, but they all, it's nothing is, it's not too different from one another. It's like they're a group and they are dysfunctional and it's like, okay, I get that, but there's nothing different about each one. It's just, each one has problems with each other. And, it, but they, again, it doesn't offer anything different to the story. It's kind of just, it's kind of listening to uh, an album that doesn't have too many different songs. All the songs are starting to sound and play the same note. And you're kind of just like, oh my god, like okay, let's go. But if the ensemble cast had, for example, Star Fox, 
That would have given you a different avenue, a different exploration that, that would have built up to why the Eternals are so important. And the same thing goes with Black Knight. Like, I think there should have been three avenues. You have the Eternals in the middle, and you have Black Knight, and you have Star Fox all converging on a point where it just kind of felt like you have Eternals and Black Knight, and they're just doing this. They're just going straight up because I don't know where it's going. I love the idea of Black Knight having more to do in that movie. Uh, if, you know, I really wish there was a Peter Jackson cut of this film that really brought all that in there. Um, Six I'm, hours of Eternals, though. Oh, give it to me. Give it to me. I, uh, I'm glad Star Fox did not have a huge role. I do not care for that character at all. Just the idea of a character's whole thing being, I'm hot, everybody likes me. And then on top of that, having it be Harry Styles, it's like, no, thank you. Um, but the it's such an outlier but maybe you know what you're bringing up i hopefully the mcu directors and everybody take that to heart and they take it as a lesson and hopefully eternals have to walk so x-men can run right so by by the time we get to x-men they will have uh fine-tuned the whole process of making a large ensemble bigger than the scale of a guardians and that way when that film comes it's not going to feel like this Um, yeah and I, I still like Eternals, and I still, I, I feel like if they announced four new movies today, and one of them was an Eternals two, I feel like that would excite me more than whatever those other three movies could possibly be, unless one of those other three movies was Spider Man versus the Kingpin. Then, you know, that's that's going to win. Uh, so that's number thirty, Eternals, with one hundred and eighty-two points, too low. Mm-hmm. Next up, number 29, with a big gap. This has 167 points. So a lot of people really do not like Eternals. That's sad. But at 167 points, Ryan, is your favorite MCU movie of all time, Iron Man 3. Uh, <laughs> That's French for three. Yeah, I've, <laughs> I've already ranted enough about this movie. It's kind of one of those things like, yep, enough said. Like, it's just you know if the villain's a joke the movie's a joke and uh and man do they botch such a what could have been such a great villain uh and such a but i mean it did pave the way for an even better villain uh uh, down the road which through sang chi and literally fixed that entire movie with one scene which is hilarious um yeah enough said (laughs) yeah that is uh iron man 3 i think yeah i'll I'll always go back to the comparison I made with Iron Man 3 where um, not to, you know, compare them just because they involve a man in a shell of armor, but I look at Iron Man 3 the same way I look at RoboCop 3, where it's the end of a trilogy where the first two movies I had a ton of fun with, and then the third one kind of falls flat, but I still have fun with it because it's the same characters in the same world, and I get that they're trying, and it could have been way, way worse, and I just kind of sit back and accept it for what it is and try to have a good time. But uh, it's my least favorite Iron Man, and it was pretty low on my list, too. Uh, I don't know if it was right. It was the third from the bottom for me. So it fell right around here for me, too. But it is what it is, Iron Man 3. Uh, If anybody out there thinks Iron Man 3 is their their favorite, I'd love to talk to them and get to know why. I like hearing those other points of view. Mm -hmm. So that was 167 points. At number 28 with 159 points, I like these big gaps we're getting here, Iron Man 2. Uh, you know, the Iron Man 2 is quite, you know, it has quite polarizing um, uh, viewpoints on the movie. It's either you just loved it because of just like, this is a, a good example of an early movie that threw in a lot of characters. You know, you get War Machine, you get Black Widow, you get Justin Hammer um and uh you know um you get nick fury uh fully in as a character Mm -hmm. uh and yeah it's it's i think it's a fun fun movie i mean and i you had quite an ensemble cast for that one yeah as well and uh yeah i'm a little surprised i'm a little surprised the the Uh, ensemble uh sorry go ahead no, yeah, it's just in, in the. I think again, the, I think this one demonstrated uh, an experiment of like what can what can you do to modernize a villain, and mm. the villain didn't didn't quite land. No, it didn't. I mean, at least one of the one of them didn't. Um, I still want to do a ranking villains show one day, maybe this year, and 
it's funny because this movie has two villains and one of them is going to be real close to the bottom and one of them is going to be real close to the top. So yeah. it's weird how that worked out. You mentioned the ensemble cast. That's one of my favorite parts of Iron Man 2 because it's the first MCU film that feels like an MCU film and not an early 2000s superhero film. So yeah. it was the first one that just explodes with color and characters and life and says, look what you're getting, it's a toy box. Uh, it's the first toy box. And this is a, a franchise that has built itself on being a toy box. So I will always adore Iron Man 2 for that. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. Thank you. Uh, so that was 159 points. Next up at number 27 with 157 points, we're getting closer now. These are starting to be close shaves. Thor The Dark World. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just sifting through sifting through some of the ones that didn't leave a lasting impression. I'm I'm totally okay with that. Thor 2, I think what elevates Thor 2 though, um I think it was I think it was a nice some nice ideas that were not executed well. Um I think Taika did say it best. One of the things that didn't come through with this one and the their first two Thor films is that Thor the character kind of falls flat. Um, and, yeah. and you don't, you don't see why Hemsworth elevates the character until Ragnarok comes in and then Ragnarok, you, you get it. And they kind of get the language that makes Thor Thor, uh, in the comics and stuff. Uh, although in the comics, he's really hyper intelligent. He's not as aloof as, as Thor can be in this, in these movies. Yeah. Um, uh, but, um, but in the sense, though, it really made the character work. It kind of, if you know, you have this ancient being who is smart, but he's, it's not that he's dumb. He's just outdated. Like he's just outdated by where the world is at. Um, but then when he goes out into the cosmos and stuff and sees different things, he's kind of more familiar because that's a territory. But Earth is a different type of modern and he's not quite attuned with it yet. Um, but it, which is why he keeps coming to Midgard, which is like the whole point of him learning, like, because there's something about Midgard that makes them special and he's trying to figure it out. Uh, but yeah, Dark World, I think the big thing that elevates it, first of all, I love the idea that they brought in uh, a director who did Game of Thrones and really did mm -hmm. like, I think did bring a lot of interesting aesthetics. Could have been a little brighter, a little bit a bit more colorful, but in yeah. the end, costumes were gorgeous. Like the costumes were fun. Um, humor, there were some humorous moments for sure. Loki shines in this one. Oh my god, um, Tom Hill, uh, Hillston just crushes it. Uh, and yeah, and, and obviously the end credit sequence, <laughs> pure drool. Did There's you drool and salivation? I, now that you said that, I think I know the answer to this question, but I forget. Did you rank this higher than Thor 1? Um, I can't remember where I ranked it. Give me two seconds here. I want to say yes. I do, But Thor 1, though, there are some scenes that really stand out that make it, in my opinion, better than Thor 2. Um, that's a good question, though. All right. I'm on my list. I'm opening it up now. Uh, all right, so I ranked it. So Thor: Dark World was second last place for me. <laughs> uh, but when you get into the list, you start to realize, like, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty there. Uh, yes, I ranked. Yeah, I ranked Thor: Dark World pretty low, and Thor One was higher, two two points higher. Okay, I'm I'm the same. I ranked Thor: The Dark World lower. In fact, that was my number thirty. That was the bottom of my list. Um, and Thor 1 was number 29 for me, like they were right at the bottom. And I flip-flop on them a lot. And I think the reason I landed on Thor The Dark World being my least favorite of the two is because the whole plot of Thor 1, you know, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's silly, whatever, but the whole plot of Thor 1 is very memorable to me. The plot of The Dark World, okay, she gets the Aether and they take her to Asgard to get rid of the Aether and then Malekith shows up. And as soon as they leave Asgard and go back to Midgard, I always forget what happens on Midgard. I know they fight. Mm -hmm. I know Thor fights Malekith. But that whole third act completely washes away from me. It's so unmemorable. Yeah. And like you said, so uncolorful and gray and just smoky and bleak looking. Uh, it looks like mm -hmm. a Zack Snyder movie. And it's just, <laughs> it doesn't look like Marvel. Uh, and 
that just always gets lost in a just smoky void for me. And I just end up not caring about the movie after that. So that, uh, that puts it lowest on my list for that reason. And uh, I'm hoping that, you know, in time we, we appreciate the Thor franchise more as time goes on. Maybe we'll get a fifth one. I don't know. But as it stands, it's definitely their weakest franchise just because they've really juggled with it. Every movie, they've kind of approached it a different way. And it's, it lacks consistency. But it is what it is. Something's got to be at the bottom. Yeah. Now, that had 157 points. Next up at number 26 with 156 points. So close. Her name is Captain Marvel, Ryan, but you can call her Carol. Carol. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this movie is kind of confusing for me. I think this one is where... I think this one, what... The trailer did a better job selling it, selling the movie than the movie itself. Um, things I did like, I love the Kree. I think they, I think it was a healthy start for what the Kree could look like in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and, and the technology and stuff. Um, I think that the first two acts of Captain Marvel are really good i think that they're i think they are fun and you kind of get to understand her the character but the whole i don't know the whole lost memory thing just didn't quite land for me it didn't i didn't find it convincing um and i'm a little disappointed in the relationship of marvell and captain marvel uh because i'm always one of those firm believers if the cartoon does it better then there's something you're doing wrong and the cartoon did it way better. Like if you watch Earth, uh, Avengers vs. Minus Heroes, which you finally did, um, you see it, you see it, you get it. And you you get the relationship more of why she becomes who she is. And uh, this one, it's, she, it's kind of, it's, she gets her moment, but it just doesn't, it's not enough. It's not enough. And, and that's, it kind of started on a weaker foundation for me. But do I think, do I think the character has a ton of potential? Absolutely. I think they could, like, for example, if the Russo's got a chance to really work on her and like build up her story, you get a very powerful Captain Marvel. Um, but yeah, I, I, and I think Brie Larson has the potential. I mean, she's a wonderful, very talented actor. And I just, I just, mm, I just, something, something is missing from her storytelling that's not, not quite there and she's not an easy character to kind of land to be honest with you like in the comics it took a lot of kind of trying to figure out the right things to make her work and then they figured it out and it was perfect uh when she became captain marvel really uh but yeah something something's missing something's missing there yeah she's hard to adapt like superman very very tricky character to adapt uh mm -hmm. i i feel like in this case the character is the thing and captain marvel we got snippets of her in this film being a really fun, interesting character. But mm -hmm. we spend so much time with her having no memories that for three quarters of the movie, she's basically, even more than that, I'd say maybe 90% of the movie, she's basically just a cipher because the plot is hiding her from us. Yeah, And that didn't give her a chance to be her it kind of stuck her in this this box of like, ooh, what kind of person is she? Is she good? Is she bad? Is she Cree? Is she human? And she, when we get those those little bits of her being her, like screaming at the scroll and about to punch the guy on the subway and just having the fun kind of this fun lady who's kind of crazy. When we did our episode on on the the movie, that was the thing, Ryan, that stuck with me. Is like I love how Captain Marvel's kind of nuts. She's a bit of a maniac because that's yeah. something different. And we only got little drops of that in the story. So I, I feel like we need this character in the second movie to just be unshamed. We yeah. need to take her off the leash. And I think Nia DaCosta is going to do that. I feel like that's the angle they're going for. Because uh, the world, in my opinion, the world of the Kree is a really bland world. I'm sorry, Ryan. I know you love the Kree world so much, but... To me, it's just like, we are military space marines. Like that to me, does that does nothing for me. That's why I don't like Halo. Um, so I needed the character to be interesting, to add some flavor to that dish. And she was only interesting sometimes. 
So it was kind of like when you go to a burrito place and you ask for spicy and it's like white people's idea of spicy. So it's like, this needs more flavor. That was Captain Marvel to me. A fine burrito and filling, but you needed more spice, man. <laughs> I will I will also just add that uh, when, you, when you're adapting Captain Marvel, she's a character that's literally the line in the sand. Like she's yeah. the one that makes the line in the sand. And when there's tension and conflict, she just comes right in the middle and like, you know, pushes everything forward. And um, yeah, just not quite, not quite ready yet. She didn't, she came out of the oven too early. And, yeah. and but that doesn't mean that it's a waste of a character. I think they could easily turn her around very, very, Secret Invasion could help turn her around very, very quickly, depending on how Secret Invasion plays out. You're right. That could very well play into it. And like, despite the fact that I ranked this movie low, I still can't wait for the Marvels because that's where Mm -hmm. that chain's coming off. So exactly. So best of luck to you, Captain. You're an awesome lady. And I think there's more of you to share with the world. Uh, Number 25 at 155 (laughs) points, just one point off. Again, too low, Ryan. This movie ranked too low. What do you think it is? I'm just checking my list real quick. Uh, I'm going to say, is it? No, that's, I'm going to say that's a me thing. Uh, maybe Ant-Man and the Wasp, I'm, I'm going to think. It's not Ant-Man and the Wasp. It's another awesome lady. It's Black Widow. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I forgot about Black Widow. We Way too low yet. on this list. Uh I think I think this movie I you know what story wise I don't think there's actually that much wrong with the movie it's a fun movie it's got it's got a solid story uh got some interesting points about you know manipulation on it and and some good some good topics there to explore uh, I think it's I think it's just some some things fall flat a taskmaster falls very flat uh and taskmaster could have been so much more uh like yeah, it's just, it's just, I think it's a humbling story. It's a very good family story that, that fits into that Disney mold really well of the dysfunctional family. Um, and it's fun, but I don't know, not much else to offer to, much, to, to that. But like Taskmaster could have been so much more, uh, but the Red Room was a cool idea. And, uh, but I think that's it. Like the villain's kind of fall flat in this one because it's about the red room itself and like the person who runs it but the person who runs it it's kind of just like a figure like they're not a person they're just a figure and you know they do a good job making him bad uh but not not as much as like not as much as like just the the base is the problem you know what i mean (laughs) (laughs) and he controls the base but he's not like he's not like he's just not He's not Are you talking like about Drake off? Yeah, he's not like Zemo. He's not like a he's not like a Zemo type villain. He's just he's just a bad guy leading a base. You know what I mean? Like he didn't have enough substance, I think. Yeah, Drake off's not the most memorable villain in the world. I'll give it that. Like he's no. the the Black Widow movie. I wasn't going into it really expecting a villain that was gonna rock my socks off because I couldn't have named one Black Widow villain going into it anyway. Yeah. I get that comic book fans are displeased with Task- Taskmaster. I get it. Displeased is a very generous <laughs> word. Very uh, generous. For me, Taskmaster didn't fall flat because even though I'm familiar with him in the comics and what he's like, and I get he has way more personality than what the movie gave us. For me, it didn't fall flat because at the end of the day, I got a lot of great action scenes with Taskmaster. The fight on the bridge and that motorcycle chase are like stupendous. And then I got a moment at the end where I know, and now it's been confirmed, that she's coming back, that we have not seen the last of her. And that this character, who is a really cool, popular Marvel villain character, is going to get more time to shine. And hopefully, like Captain Marvel, more time for her personality to come out and have more fun with and be let off the chain. So I, I liked it as an introduction to the character, knowing that there's more to come. And as far as Black Widow herself is concerned, I think this is one of the best solo character pieces that the MCU has given us. Uh, I appreciate her so much more now. 
and mm -hmm. I appreciate everything she did. And no Marvel movie has ever made me go back and rethink the other Marvel movies more than this one. This was real high on my phase four list. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, that's that you definitely provide some food for thought there. I think what would fix Taskmaster, honestly, is that this guy, this the Drakeoff guy, I think that he obviously is investing in programs like the Red Room, for example. And if I think it could fix a lot of fans if you literally have like a, a video advertisement in one of the movies of like Taskmaster selling his program and his suit. Uh, and then if you did that, and then then you can just build whatever story you want with with the current Taskmaster we have, because then at least fans can go, oh, okay, now I get how she's like such a good mimic, and like you know the program, like how Taskmaster adapts that program, and like if you show potential in that. Maybe I don't know. We'll see what Thunderbolts has to offer. Uh, that movie just gets more and more exciting every day. That movie, honestly, Thunderbolt seems so promising right now, and I'm very yeah. interested to see how it's going to play out. All right, so that was Black Widow, way too low on the list with 155 points. At number 24, Ryan, with 151 points, uh, Thor 1. Okay, all right, yeah. we're climbing, we're climbing. Pretty good movie, oh. fun. Uh, I think this movie... Art style is kind of weird, but um, but some golden moments. Oh my god! When my favorite moment to this day is when Odin strips Thor of his power. Yeah, I love that scene. I absolutely love that scene. And and then when Thor raids the shield facility for his hammer, love that scene. Right, it's such a classic hero's journey. This film, um, the, the the stuff that Thor gets put through, the ringer he gets put through. It is classic hero's journey, and maybe classic hero's journey is just not modern enough for a lot of people, so it fell flat, and I get it, and the way they handled Jane Foster was really unfortunate, so I get that too. Um, I had this, I think, the second last on my list, and again, I don't hate it, but there's just so much more juicy goodness that had to go above it. And that's all there is to it. That's it. And that was Thor with 151 and tied with Thor, but it broke the tie and got a rank above it at 151 points. Number 23 is your incredible Hulk. Yes. Honestly, uh, you know, I'm actually big. I, I'm actually, this movie's been growing on me after rewatching it a few times now. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's actually a really good Hulk movie. I think what hurts it personally is it restrains itself sometimes mm -hmm. too much. Um, and then the CG obviously needs a mad update, but like overall there's, it's a fun movie. It's fun. And there are some good moments like Emil Blonsky's a fun story to watch and how it evolves yes. very quickly. Uh, and then on top of that, you have the raw story sprinkled, sprinkled in on the side there, which is going to be really fun. Um, uh, and I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a solid modern Hulk story. I think that's, that's the way I'll describe it. Cause like Hulk's an old character. He's been around a long time. Um, but I think they, I think they find, I think they kind of did the right thing in this one. And it's kind of. It has some fun moments. There's some scenes that are completely not necessary at all, but most most of the movie is really really good, and it's still growing on me today. And it's just the only thing is they kind of they're still holding. They still held back a few concepts and ideas that could have pushed the story really forward and kind of had some fun with it. But I think they, I think that you know, even for Ruffalo to come in afterwards and and you know to pick up those themes uh and and still kind of give us a really good hulk that complements where the good things of the old movie did uh the incredible hulk movie did uh it worked like it just i think it really works and it, it still grows like the more i watch ruffalo's hulk the more i go back and realize that incredible hulk has a lot of good seeds that were planted that could be well developed like i every scene in avengers that has ruffalo I get excited. Like mm -hmm. 
my like i love the india scene like when widow tries to recruit him and to stop lying to me like when he first did that i shook in my seat like i was just like yeah it was just like oh my god <laughs> like but what's fun about it is how good widow sells it all the scenes would be nothing if widow didn't sell how scary and intimidating the hulk is um in fact the the entire battle on the helicarrier like when she's like we're okay right like we're good and he starts changing and she's like you just see the fear oh my god it just <laughs> that gets me so jacked like i you know i always we used to joke in our acting program you know acting is reacting like the whole thing but like you get it like that is that is the most fundamental example of acting is reacting and the scene after he turns the Hulk and starts like smashing around, like and chasing her and everything, and and uh, you know uh, Fury's like, okay, you know we found Hawkeye, he's here and stuff. Who's gonna engage him? And you see her there holding herself, like, oh man, that's so good. <laughs> I need more. I need more scenes of that with the Hulk. I want to see pure fear in people's eyes. Yeah, and it's a shame because Hulk, since Hulk has gotten smart, we've lost that aspect of him. So hopefully yeah. we will see the flip side of that, but we'll see that kind of fear with Red Hulk. And now it's even more palpable because we know Red Hulk is not a nice person, right? Yes. So. Yeah, no. Ah, oh, man. I just, that, that's, what, that's what gets me with it. even the Incredible Hulk. Like just the, and I love how Ross, the first, his first reaction, and again, his reaction also sells an entirely different story, is just like, that's my property. Yeah. Like that, that result is my property and he needs to contain it. And I love, I just, oh, I love it. Oh, it gets me so dark. And both banners, um, Mark Ruffalo and Edward Norton, they have played so well the idea of Banner himself is scared of this monster and what he could do. And Incredible Hulk really showcased that really well. And in our episode where we covered it like two or three years ago now, because that was a long time ago. Uh, we just sort of stuck to the fact that it is an outstanding Hulk movie and just an okay, pretty good MCU movie um, because of how outside the box it is. However, time is going to do interesting things in this movie, isn't it, Ryan? Because not only has Ross come back, but now Abomination has come back. Now Samuel Stern's The Leader is coming back, which is just, I still can't believe that's happening. It's only a matter of time until Betty Ross comes back. So we will we'll no longer be able to say that it's only an okay MCU movie because it is going to be a crucial piece of the groundwork by the time, you know, Captain America New World Order comes out. So I am super curious to watch this one in like three years and see where it falls on the ranking list at that point. Because right now it is number 23. I don't think that's going to stay the same i think 23 mm -hmm. is going to be too low for this movie in a few it's years 23 out of 40 i think out of, out of 30 right now but by then 30. it'll probably be out of like yeah. 30, 36 whatever so yeah yeah I think, that's right it's an even 30 i remember that now, yeah. yeah even 30 incredible hulk is one to watch there we go number 22 now ryan at 150 points just one point above the incredible hulk Ant-Man and the Wasp. Okay, so I wasn't too far off. It's, mm. Yeah, I think this one, this is a good example of it's just fun. It's just fun. Pure fun. Doesn't have to doesn't have to break any ground. It doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't have to it doesn't have to add anything substantial. It's just literally a fun next day in the life of Ant-Man. And now the Wasp. Uh, which it. wasp the wasp is the groundbreaking element of the movie but you knew she was coming and like you, you, there's no real there was small build up but there wasn't any real like hype build up it was just like yeah this is now you're getting ant-man and the wasp literally that is what the movie is now you're getting both of them yeah and you're getting um in my opinion a really really great showcase of powers in this movie um mm -hmm. i ranked it higher than Ant-Man this year, because after watching it again, I'm like, you know what? Ant-Man is fun. Ant-Man 1 is fun. But Ant-Man and the Wasp, 
took the powers to another level and they got so creative with it. They yeah. took advantage of every bit of those pin particles that they could. And they did what you should do when you're writing any one of these movies is they told a story and told action sequences in that story that literally could not be done with any other character in the Marvel yeah. pantheon. The kitchen fight scene is like, still stands out to me as so much fun. Just yeah. like the way the guy throws the knife and she does the, the flip. Oh, feel it every single time. And that car chase, man, that car chase gets me. I love it. So Ammon and the Laws had 150 points and number 22. All right, I get it. I think that's an okay place for it. Mm -hmm. The next movie at number 21 had a big jump. This one had 139 points, and that's Ant-Man. Uh, yeah. It, this this one, though, is a resilient film in the sense of, like, it had no plan. <laughs> lost director. <laughs> yeah. Like, lost the director and the main writer of the movie. And... And at the same time, they uh, they bring in a guy who's such a big comic book nerd and just turns it right around, and then and salvages an incredible story that is fun, modern a modern Ant Man story for a character who's very weird, very mm -hmm. weird. But they made it work, and man, did they make it work! And I love it. And it's a simple story, a lot of fun is had in it, and it's it's just great visuals. I love the suit. I think the suit was really cool. Oh, the suit is like no perfect. It looks like they just plucked it right out of a comic book. Mm -hmm. Great little movie. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it is what it is. It just sets up a new little fun corner of the world. Um, what has me most excited, all I'll say, is uh, Peyton Reed has said for Quantumania, uh, he does not want Quantumania. He told Kevin Feige, I don't want Quantumania to be another um, placeholder movie. I want it to be an Avengers-sized epic movie. So that gets me very excited for the way they close out this trilogy. So Ant-Man, like, just solid, right? Just usually falls around here on the list, and it's a solid place for it. Number 20, with 123 points, we had another big jump there. This is interesting. I'm surprised this, this year. Thor Love and Thunder. Oh, OK. Crack in the top uh, 20, I did not think that was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little... I am, Thor, Love, and Thunder's kind of hit different people in different ways. Like, it's mm -hmm. not... It didn't quite get it. Like, it didn't quite land the impact that people wanted. Um, in the end, to me, again, it was just a fun story that builds up a character. It builds up the character a little bit. Um, but I don't like, again, I think kind of, I think it had a hard time really committing to a certain theme or idea and just kind of gave you a fun little ride of like, here's Thor. We had Thor Ragnarok. That was amazing. And here's like the Tuesday after Thor Ragnarok. And like, you know what I mean? Like, let's just have a little fun there. Yeah, it was, uh, it was my least favorite phase four movie. Yeah, And I feel that way about it. I feel like the plot, the story was trying to tell had a lot of big stakes, but yeah. they told that story with the nonchalance of this is another day in the life of Thor. Yes. And that was a weird way to do that. Uh, it, it, it kind of feels like, and maybe this is by design, but it kind of feels like when, you know, you're a little kid and you're reading a fairy tale and big things are treated with like childlike indifference. And then the mm -hmm. prince blew up the whole castle and everybody died. The and, <laughs> and it, it's it's so strange. Uh, yeah. it, because it really doesn't fall too far from the tree that is Ragnarok. Uh, see that there? Because Ragnarok is a tree, Yggdrasil. Ah, Viking humor. Uh, it doesn't fall too far from that tree, but it doesn't satisfy people the same way Ragnarok did. So I just thought it was a very curious and odd film and a very curious and odd way to tell a story. Yeah. So, so that is Thor Love and Thunder at number 20. Coming in at number 19 with 120 points, Avengers Age of Ultron. Yeah, not surprised there either. Uh, this one, I think this was a solid attempt with Whedon to really kind of 
get in his groove with the Marvel stuff. Um, I, the cottage scene just really kind of shakes that movie the wrong way. Uh, it had some really cool concepts. Wanda steals the show, in my opinion, in this movie uh, with the whole mind thing and the. Uh, I love the the weird like you know static movement exit of the door in the first battle there. Uh, so yeah, there's some cool concepts in this movie. I think the cottage scene really kind of hurt its momentum, uh, and Ultron was really cool, uh, really cool villain. Uh, but yeah, I just. Again, this is just, you know, one, I think it was it was setting up the pieces nicely. Uh, and there, uh, there was the talk about the deleted scenes. But to be fair, I don't think the deleted scenes would have done too much. Like this this deleted scene we have, like this deleted scene that doesn't, um, that everyone's talking about, the one that Thor's in the water and gets the visions and stuff. I don't think that would have fixed the entire movie personally. I don't think it would have because the cottage scene really does some weird momentum to the thing. I think what, what would have worked better is the, the tension between the team is literally play up. Like maybe they had to be stuck in a safe house and now they literally have to sit with each other and sit with the results of their own actions a bit more as opposed to like, Let's forget about everything for a minute. And now Widow and Hulk have a story because they're both monsters. Like, I get it, but it just it just didn't rub the right way. It just didn't it didn't it didn't fit in the it's kind of a circle in the square peg here kind of thing. Um and the yeah, and honestly, I think that there's some really cool ideas that could have been pulled out further, like like Cap and Tony not getting along. In fact, there is one deleted scene. I think they should have kept in it for, for a bit there is there's actually a fight with vision when he comes out of the cradle and they, they have like a, a little bit of a longer fight and there's more tension between the characters. Mm -hmm. I think that really would have fit better. Um, yeah. So that's where I feel. This age of Ultron is an interesting movie. I think like most MCU fans in the world, I rank it as my least favorite Avengers but that's literally just because those are four movies that I adore and the other three just have more that I adore than this one. Like <laughs> yeah. I, I really have nothing bad to say about age of Ultron. Um, I, I guess I could take or leave the Hulk widow romance too. I didn't dislike it at all. I thought it was fine. And I, especially from widow's point of view, like now that we know more about her from that great movie that everybody ranked way too low, uh, she's just a lonely person trying to find her place in the world. And every yeah. time she tries to interact with the rest of the world, it just kind of pushes her away. And I just find that fascinating and heartbreaking and wonderful. Um, I personally love the cabin scene. Uh, Linda Cardellini may or may not play a huge factor in that. I don't know, but I, I didn't find that it broke the pace for me at all. I just thought this is a really solid movie that was just outdone by three even more really solid movies. So that's where I stand on Age of Ultron, or as the guy I used to work with calls it, Avengers Edge of Altor. Uh, <laughs> I'll, never, I'll never let that go. At number 18, tied with Ultron, but winning through the tiebreaker round, Captain America won. Really? It ranked Yeah, low. with 120 mm. points. And this was your number one film, Ryan. That's, uh, that, that really helped push it above Age of Ultron. Uh, when the tiebreaker came. So tell us about Captain America 1 and why it's way too low on the list for you. It is way too low on the list because this was more of a solid attempt at an actual like comic book experience. Like Iron Man definitely hit the comic book experience, don't get me wrong, but it went for more grounded, a uh, grounded approach where I feel <laughs> like Captain Cap went the totally opposite direction and it still felt grounded. Um I'm really surprised it ranked so low. Ah, oh, I love Captain mm. America, the first one. I mean, I guess it's kind of biased, though, but I think the other thing that makes it stand out is, again, like, Hugo Weaving as Red Skull is fun. Like, that is fun. Um, uh, and the and it's colorful. It's got a solid flowing story. Uh, yeah, it is... I, You know, you talk about... So you, you have Iron Man come out. And you have Iron Man come out, and you have um, you have Iron Man come out, and then people are all like, "Wow, Marvel's doing something special." And then Thor comes out, doesn't quite land the market. But like, oh, that's just Marvel for you. 
But then Cap comes out, and Cap's a big risk. Like, Cap's a period piece. I'm calling him Cap. He's not your friend. He's my best friend. <laughs> I wear his merchandise. That'll be it. All right, so... So, so yeah, you have this, like, period piece movie, comic book level storytelling, a comic book theatrical villain, Red Skull, that's super fun. And Hugo Weaving crushes it. Like, he really creates this wonderful villain. So many layers of story. Um, and it just sets up the world. It's just, it's such a world builder. And, it, oh. And just the heroic moments. Just, yes. Shower me with the heroic moments. The shield throwing, the, the, the you know, um, the, the heroic posing, if you will. I love that he, they make, I love that they make him a musical to, to kind of be like the advertising of war propaganda. Like, it's so good. <laughs> so good. Uh, I'm really surprised it didn't rank higher. Yeah, it's pretty low on this list. Um, I, I love the musical scene too. Uh, I think. If somebody were to ask you point blank, what do you think of Captain America, the first Avenger, Ryan? I think your answer would be, you would make like Peggy Carter and you would shoot at them. And then you'd lower your gun and say, I think it works. And that would yeah. Really <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, honestly, I, it's, it's, I think it's a movie that proves that you don't need a formula. You need to focus on like what the character represents and and Captain America, I love, I love that they don't, I love how brutally honest they are. That yes, you have this person who's able to do incredible things. And what do you use them for? Propaganda. And exactly it's like the narrative. And I and and I love that. I love, 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 love that. And then he gets his chance and he does the whole thing. And and even when he frees all the prisoners, they're like, who are you? He's like, I'm Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the most self-flagellating things Marvel has ever done because that they're making fun of the fact that they use them for exactly that reason during yeah. the height of the war. Um, I, I really like this movie too. I particularly, my favorite aspect of it is the fact that you've got Joe Johnston directing and he's an old hand at uh, ILM and Lucasfilm. So you have a movie that looks and feels like a star Wars movie. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the set design, everything is exactly like it's pulled out of like a Ralph McQuarrie painting. And I loved that so much. And then on top of that, it feels kind of like an Indiana Jones movie because you got a hero going around punching Nazis and riding on motorcycles. So it's all good in the hood. I love it so much. My mom just came home and she says her favorite Marvel movies are any movie where you see Thor's pecs. Right? Couldn't agree. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. You know, so, you know, Thor has always been an attractive character. Actually, I'll never forget to... Um, uh, my first girlfriend, I, I told her parents that I was a big comic book nerd. And the first thing she showed me was the first thing she showed me was a trading card. She had of Thor because she loved Thor that much. <laughs> oh, she had a trading card. Of him. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And it's just Cause she loved them that much. Like she, she uses a bookmark when she reads romance novels. That's how much she loved them. Uh, did you dress up as Thor to like, no. Sure. Next no, time. I didn't need to impress the parents. I was ah. well, my foot in the door was was good enough. But like, <laughs> uh, side funny story, real quick though, is like later on we ran into each other, and she was she was dating someone else, and the dad, her dad was drunk, and he just grabbed me, and he's like, "You were my number one." <laughs> oh, the truth comes out, baby. And it was right in front of them, and I was just like, oh, "Thanks." Like, oh no! And it was like very much like the Joker. He's like, "Remember, Jack, you are my number." <laughs> in that situation, all you can do is just smile and nod and be like, mm, mm -hmm, "Okay, <laughs> okay, thanks." Oh boy, uh, I, I hope those two are okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right, so number 17 with 113 points. Again, too low as far as I'm concerned. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Only thing that hurt this movie for me, great movie overall, a lot of fun, great storytelling, um, great music. Oh, my God, great visuals. Uh, I just think it was too long. Wow. Yeah, I've heard that before. I've heard people say it was because it is significantly longer than the first one. Um. 
I, I've never, the, again, the only time I have ever felt a movie is too long was Transformers 3 and 4. Uh, length has never been an issue for me. And with Guardians 2, the more I watch it, the better it becomes. And I love it even more than the first one. Guardians yeah. 2 was pretty high for me. Let me tell you where I put it. Uh, it was my number five. Yeah. I love Guardians 2. Top five, yeah. Oof. Yeah. Honestly, true words have never been spoken for Guardians 1, which is short, sweet, straight to the point. And 2 is a lot more fun, more, explora more exploration, more characters. Um, the Sovereign, I, I, I love them. I think they, I think they cannot wait to see Warlock, personally. Um, yeah, just felt it was too long. That was the only thing. But it's not a bad thing. It's just too long. You can just stop the movie after an hour and be like, oh, that, was, that was the greatest movie I've ever seen in my life. Uh, yeah. All right, so that was Guardians 2 at number 16 with another nice little gap here with only 106 points. Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Uh, so really? This, yeah, this falls almost in the middle. Not quite. I think the next one is the middle, and I think it's a very interesting mm. pick for the middle. But I think being really close to the middle is completely understandable considering how fresh this movie is in everybody's mind mm. because it's either going to go one of two ways it's either going to have recency bias where everybody is thinking oh it's the last one i saw and it was awesome so yeah my favorite or it's going to have recency unbiased where it's like oh it's too fresh i i, I don't have an opinion on it yet so that's being fair. in the middle works yeah that's a pretty solid pretty solid way to look at it um yeah, honestly, what steals the show for me in this one though is is uh, Namor and um, and Ironheart. Uh, yeah. Shuri was fun. Shuri's a gr Shuri is like close runner up to those two, but like uh, man, like Namor Namor steals it for me. Like just steals it. Like his intensity, and this this goes back to like you know Widow reacting to the Hulk. Everyone reacting to him is is really good in this one and like and the presence he brings and my favorite shot of of that my favorite scene if you will is the is the invasion of wakanda uh that is just so fun so fun they did namor really really well they did ironheart really really well this movie just made me want more than anything else i want a movie now i want a part three where it's just shuri okoye nakia and mbaku just going on an adventure because those yeah. four together, oh my god, what a team! They they would be so much fun to spend like hours with. Like, give me that movie. Yeah. Umbaku steals the show too. Like he does, he does a great job. But like all around, any scene he's in, he's hilarious. Like I just had such a good like. My favorite, my favorite one is when he walks in the throne room with a carrot, and he's like, "Why are they here?" <laughs> <laughs> I've never eaten a carrot that way, the Bugs Bunny way, but I feel like it would be so much fun. Just walk around with it. Try it. It's got to have the Try little it. green thing hanging on the end. You don't yeah. really see that anymore at grocery store. You got to uh, one day. So that was number 16 with 106 points. At number 15, right in the middle with 103 points. This is a very interesting middle one, Ryan. Iron Man. Huh. And the reason well, I find that interesting is because on our ranking Star Wars lists, a new hope always usually ends up in the middle too. So mm -hmm. it's funny how that works. Well, it broke a lot of ground, biggest risk ever. Um, what more needs to be said about that movie? And it, but it just goes to show you uh, what that movie has done for the, the movies that are ahead of it. Right. Mm -hmm. like, I, it, it's uh, no matter how many years going forward, I will look back at this, you know, talk to my niece about it. Like such a big risk. And it was like the most unpopular character you could possibly imagine <laughs> to start off with. Like, you know, my brother and I always joke and say it, you know, always joke and say it. Like you thought X-Men, like let's say X-Men 2 was good. You thought that was good. Imagine a world where the Marvel comes out with the first movie and it's Iron Man and it's infinitely better than that. Right. Would, like you I just, you couldn't, myself, you <laughs> You'd be like, stop lying, I hate you. I never want to yeah. do you again. But yeah. look what they did, right? And it was a perfect cocktail of like John Favreau knowing what he was doing and just a brilliant cast 
inhabiting these characters in a way we had never seen before and a fantastic story and a yeah. suit that was comic book perfect like that suit I, I don't think the suit has ever looked better than it has in Iron Man 1 like he's had a new I suit every movie yeah. Iron Man 1 I don't think it's ever looked as good as Iron Man 1 I think what's crazy about the suit in the first movie is it looks real yeah it looks like someone could actually make it which is nuts they they had to you almost have to be Tony Stark to make that kind of movie yeah to put all those pieces together and they did it and it falls in the middle it is what it is i i'm of the mind that uh, every year i can't remember who it is i think it's the national film registry but every year they do this thing where they they come out with a small list of films that have to be i think at least a certain amount of time old and they deem them as culturally historically or aesthetically significant so all the you know the most important films have been given this uh, title like Citizen Kane, you know, all, all the big, huge ones, The Godfather. I think it's only a matter of time till Iron Man is on that list if it hasn't been put there already because of just what it's done. Culturally significant, yes, 100%. So that's Iron Man. That's where it falls in the number 15 spot with 103. And now in the number 14 spot with 101, Doctor Strange. Interesting. Okay. I'm uh, doing the doc for those just listening. I'm doing the Doctor Strange thing, and I think I'm doing the fingers wrong because I look more like Spider Man having a seizure yeah. or Spider Man directing air traffic. Yeah, that's it. You got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's Doctor Strange. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, honestly, I think the only thing that, that kind of hurts the movie is how dark and dull it is. <laughs> I mean, it's Doctor Strange. You, you, Jack Kirby, if you ever look at Jack Kirby's stuff with Doctor Strange, it is bright colorful and full of weird shapes but it is awesome um i would say what what excited me about this character and this is the only thing i will say about this movie is that the fact that it's dr strange like i love dr strange in comic books he's so fun and cartoons any cartoon like the 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 episode he was introduced in in the spider-man cartoon was so fun yes he's such a fun character um and yeah, it's just oh man, he's when they introduced him. That's when I knew Marvel's. I'm like, yes, Marvel, go there, like go as weird as you can go, because this is what's gonna make you shine. And they couldn't have picked a better actor. Um, honestly, I can't even think of another Doctor Strange to be cast uh, than Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, and on the um, on that note. It's, I love that he still wants to play the character. He's like, I, I'll play him until he's no longer interesting. Mm -hmm. And I just literally wrapped watching uh, No Way Home today. And because uh, I'm off today. And I love, I love the fact that he just like, he has like, he's, he's helps drive the story. And I want, I want to see him in other shows just driving stories because he's such a fun character to kind of interweave in with so many others. So. He's a great character, and that makes me so happy that Benedict Cumberbatch feels that way. Because he, mm -hmm. his franchise is the franchise where I'm like, give me nine of these, right? Yeah. That's that's what we all want to see. Um, and I think we can lump these together, because this was number 14 with 101. And number 13, right above it with 100, was Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. So they, they ranked right next to each other. Um, yeah. They are very different movies. You're right. The backgrounds of the first one were very dull and dim. Uh, but I think they made up for it with the costumes because the costumes in Doctor Strange 1 were, mm, they just, they get my motor running in ways that costumes shouldn't. And I'm worried and concerned. Uh, and then with Multiverse of Madness, they stepped it up and really made good on the title because it was a mad movie with lots of crazy things happening, a very Sam Raimi movie. But I feel, I don't know if you agree, Ryan, I feel like even though I enjoyed the hell out of both of these films, I feel like we still have yet to see Doctor Strange Unleashed. Yeah, I, I, we're not there yet, um, but we're well on the way. Uh, honestly, I love what Sam Raimi did for Doctor Strange. I've always, I've always imagined what it would be like if we had a movie directed by Sam Raimi. Couldn't imagine a better director. I mean, Scott Derrickson was good, but Raimi was infinitely better. Mm -hmm. um and i mean the spells were awesome to watch the the colors the the action sequences the the story it was all there and it checked off so many cool boxes um the, the illuminati 
Yeah. I mean, heaven forbid that they, you know, uh, I mean, it's just real shame that they spoiled certain moments, uh, but there's still some, there's still some big reactions. And I'm, I was so glad to be a part of those opening nights where like, where some big like that happens, like seeing Reed Richards come in. You know, and it's so funny you say that because right now I'm looking at you and you have like, this wonderful hair that you always have and the side of your head is shaved and it almost looks white in the light and you're wearing blue. You look like Reed Richards right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Can you stretch uh, your fingers and do like weird gross stuff with your body right now? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, no, uh, but yeah, it's just, it was it's so many great surprises, so much comic book fun. Um, Professor X using the mind thing, Professor X showing up. Uh, and like, I love the wavy lines. The like when he does the mind reading thing more of that just give me more of those movies please just, yeah. just keep slapping just like literally just slap me in the face with more movies like that just like <laughs> here's your fantastic four here's your doctor doom you know here's your uh what is it what's another good one? here's your blade here's your uh here's your iron fist the luke cage heroes for hire like go just go there just take it weird just don't I think one thing these movies going forward have learned, try not to ground it too much. There is, there's a weird stint of comic book movies that had to be so grounded and so real, but I am glad we are way past that. At this Thank point. God we have moved on and that train has left the station. Yeah. Uh, I love both of these. Give me more Dr. Strange. Uh, announce a bunch, announce yeah. a bunch of them. Make if there's out. three, if the, it's yeah, like you beautifully said earlier, it's you now have a toy box. Why aren't you using it? Like, why aren't you throwing in as many toys as you can? The whole point of Marvel is all these characters overlap over each other, and you could still tell a good story. If I, but I swear to God, if I ever hear the words dark, tragic, and real, um, <laughs> or sorry, uh, dark, dark, gritty. yes, gritty, that's the one I was looking for. Dark, gritty, and uh, realistic. I, I will literally just flip a table. Oh, breaking news. Fantastic Four reboot will be dark, gritty, and realistic. <laughs> uh, well, then they didn't learn anything from the last director. No, they didn't. All right, so that was number 13 with 100 points, Multiverse of Madness. And number 12 with 97 points, The Avengers. Okay. The good old classic vanilla Avengers. Nothing Still really to this to be... day. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Nothing really need to be added here. I mean, yeah. it's just a solid movie, period. It's... Solid movie still to this day. One of my favorite experiences in a movie theater. One of my favorite films. I went and saw this damn thing three times and I have never done that with any non-Star Wars film ever. Like it just, it blew my mind. It worked. It shouldn't have worked and it worked. It is what it is. This is also, this and Iron Man 1 needs to be deemed culturally, aesthetically or historically significant by the National Film Board because it's just, it's Avengers. You know, love it or hate it. It is what it is, and it changed the world. Number 11 with 91 points for Ragnarok. Okay. Yeah, great movie. A lot of fun. Uh, I think it, the refresh that was not only asked for, but just delivered on a such... Delivered in a way we never thought it could be possible. I'll never right. forget my biggest memory with that movie. I'll never forget Ke Kevin Smith's reaction to that movie. Uh huh. Take my money, take my child's money. That's, I mean, you've got a character that had two swings and two misses and then a home run. Um, you, it, it's, it's going to be held up as the baseline for Thor from now on. And sometimes that'll probably be to its detriment, like it was with Love and Thunder. And, and who knows? Like, Thor is still something that is a question mark in terms of how his franchise is going to be looked at when it's all said and done. But Ragnarok is kind of indisputably the best of his movies. And uh, it was just doing everything right. And one of the most colorful motion pictures ever made. So I can't fault it for that at all. Uh, now we're entering the top 10, Ryan. All right. So Ragnarok had 91. The next movie had 89. What do you think is the first movie with 89 points to crack our top 10? Guardians of the Galaxy? Incorrect. Damn it. It is Spider-Man Homecoming. Um, you know what? Interesting one to, to break into the top 10 with, uh, mm -hmm. starting on the top 10 list. Uh, 
all I can say about this movie uh, that, you know, again, I, at this point, a lot of these movies don't need much elaboration any further than like, you know, they're, they're great for being what they are. Reintroducing a character without an origin story, yet still representing everything they stand for. That's how you do a superhero movie. That's how you do a superhero movie today without making it go stale. They literally bring in a no, they they do the classic Marvel formula. They bring in a character, they bring in an actor nobody knows, and and focus on what the character stands for, and and what makes the what makes the character who they are. And it's just an absolute joy to watch. Yeah, this is. It, it's such a beautiful, beautiful movie that did everything right. Um, and most importantly, it listened to the heartbeat that was Spider-Man fandom. And I don't mean, you know, it dug through Reddit forums and paid attention to what the trolls said. I mean, it just listened to the overall heartbeat of the fandom, which is something that I don't think Amazing Spider-Man 1 did. Amazing Spider-Man 1 felt like a very tone-deaf movie. Because, mm -hmm. yes, everybody's fresh off of Spider-Man 3, and a lot of people are saying, oh, we hated it, we hated... But the things that people hated about Spider-Man 3 could have very easily been redeemed in a Spider-Man 4. Um, and like they could, of course, corrected that so easily. And rather than doing that, Sony rebooted because, A, they wanted to cash in on the uh, 3D craze that Avatar 1 had started. And the less I say about 3D, the better. And two, they wanted to cash in on the other craze that was even then just dying out, which was what you just brought up, the dark, gritty, and realistic craze that Batman Begins started. By 2012, yep. when Amazing Spider-Man 1 came out, that was already just about going the way of the Dodo. I think Fantastic Four was the last gasp of that, and people were starting to wise up. But they gave us a Spider-Man movie that was steeped in shadows and not colorful and just like, no, don't do that, please. Uh, so it was so tone deaf, and Homecoming is the exact opposite of that. And to top it all off, it gave us a, a third act twist that nobody saw coming, which is so hard to do in any superhero movie, let alone a Spider-Man movie, where people know the characters backwards and forwards. I adore Homecoming with all my heart and soul. Yeah, yeah. And and the other the other big achievement is they made a modern Spider Man and yet still made it as relatable as the original. Yep. And they made it modern without turning it into something that wasn't timeless anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's hard to do. So kudos to them. That was number ten with eighty nine points. Spider Man Homecoming, number nine. Ryan with eighty four points. Black Panther. Groundbreaking on thousands of levels beautifully done and what i love about this is how much the the culture influenced the movie there was no there was no kind of american theme here there is nothing that made there's no hollywood influence on this this yes. was a love letter uh from african culture to like you know the superhero and it's mm. It blows my mind how young Ryan Coogler is. Like when you see this guy, he's he's younger than us. And he was able to tell such a mature story and, you know, juggle all those moving pieces. I think if I had been asked to direct a big budget Hollywood movie like this, I would be so terrified. I would probably just pee my pants and curl up into a ball. Mm -hmm. And this guy who's younger than us, not only did he not curl up into a ball, but he approached this head on. Uh, he approached a movie that could have very easily gone wrong head on and made it work like gangbusters. Ryan Kugel is brilliant. I mean, brilliant. Well, now that's Black Panther. The, the beautiful film that has stood the test of time at number nine with 84 points. Now at number seven with 79 points, seven and eight were tied, but this one lost out in the tie-breaking round. Captain America Civil War. Yeah, uh, and it's not a bad thing for it to be in top ten. It still still holds, still holds. Great movie. Uh, I think this broke a little more ground than the Avengers because not only do you have such a epic cast all in one movie, 
uh, but having them all fight each other and in probably what is arguably one of the most epic battle sequences ever. Um, mm -hmm. Russo's did it, man. And to introduce Spider-Man in a movie, uh, you know, not only not only do they introduce him in this movie and he gets a movie later, but they introduce him in this movie, period. <laughs> like, like they, you know, you have Civil War and you're like, okay, how are they going to raise the stakes? We know the Avengers are all going to fight each other. We know these characters. What, what new characters are they going to add to this battle? And they throw in Spider-Man of all characters. That is... Whew. And goddamn, that suit was beautiful. The way they handled Zemo was great. Like everything was, I mean, the you talk about how if the cartoon does it better, you're doing something wrong. Um, I will always hold this movie up on a pedestal as you took the source material. This is what every comic book movie should try to do. And I think a lot of the hardcore fanboys who like to hit on these movies, I don't think they quite grasp this, which is you should try to change the comics so that you are better than them. Don't adhere to the comics so that you're a one-for-one -one representation of them because that doesn't work. That's why video game movies don't work because something that works as an interactive game does not work as a story that you have no control over. Uh, so the idea of taking this very famous popular comic book series and changing a lot of stuff, somehow making it better, that's exactly what you're supposed to do as a comic book filmmaker. So mm -hmm. the Russos did it. It was a tall order, but they did it. That was number eight, Civil War with 79 points. Number seven, beating it out, also with 79, but it, it won the tie-breaking round. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Ringy Dingies. That's what I, I officially call it. Yeah, I said the Ringy Dingies. Uh, I said it before. I'll say it again. Uh, the fact that they, they, they fixed, they reinvigorated and fixed a villain in, in one scene. Brilliant. Brilliant. And uh, I love that they made a Kung Fu Marvel film. I'm all for it. It was beautiful. It was fun. It was funny. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I want to see more. Like I just, it just literally, that's, that's the best thing. I best thing I say about Shang-Chi. I want to see more. I feel the same way in terms of, I want to see more. The world building that they, they gave us was great. Um, however, controversy time. Hey, it's everybody's favorite time. It's controversy time. Um, as I said in Age of Ultron, Ryan, Age of Ultron is my least favorite Avengers film just because something had to be last and the other three are even better. Um, Shang-Chi is my second last Phase 4 film. It ranks mm -hmm. second last in Phase 4 for me uh, just because I don't find it bad. I just find it very basic by the numbers hero journey story and everything else above it was that and more it was it, it was yeah. reaching out and trying new things and shang chi played it very safe um it did some things that i wish had been handled a little differently like the way they handled death dealer and the final boss battle for lack of a better word just being this big cgi dragon mess was a little bit underwhelming for me especially because the story was so personal between yeah. shang chi and wenwu so it's not a movie I dislike by any stretch of the imagination, but it's just a totally safe, very good, normal story that they told beautifully with dazzling colors and a wonderful cast. So I got nothing against it, but it had to be lower on my list than, than it fell on the main list here. But that was number seven, Shang-Chi with 79 points. Now we jump up 10 whole points, Ryan, at number six, 69 yeah. points. Oh, Spider-Man Far From Home, a.k.a. Mysterio got his groove back. <laughs> a.k.a. Mysterio's the man. Uh, it's about damn time. All I will say was about damn time to bring in Mysterio, who is a big, big villain, who's a colorful villain for Spider-Man, actually, to do. Um, and they made him modern. They found a way to they found a really good way to make this character modern in today's world. And I love they, they did exactly what he would do if he were in today's world, which is shift the narrative to make Spider-Man a villain. And it's so good. Um, Jake Gyllenhaal not only surprised the crap out of me with his performance, um, 
but the the brilliance the brilliance of the bar scene in that movie oh my god like i was almost convinced almost convinced that i'm like okay mr this may be a different mysterio it's possible he's kind of an anti-hero at times no the the bar scene total transformation and it was so much fun <laughs> there's so many ways mysterio could have gone wrong he's such a hard character to adapt and i think that that is the perfect way to do him the whole movie felt like a giant live action episode of spectacular spider-man so that's just all yeah. the hearts for me uh yeah. and and even with all that being said this is still my least favorite of the trilogy again only because <laughs> something has to be last uh but yeah it's a great film spider-man far from home i love you you have a uh umberto tutsi song in you so how could i not love you and now Ryan, I actually you... i i will also <laughs> add one last thing about mysterio i will also add mm -hmm is my favorite scene is the germany fight scene when he uses all his illusions <laughs> just just drool i i all would right. i just salivated the whole time of that scene like just to go him fighting through the school to the top of the empire or to the eiffel tower to uh mysterio putting him in the globe in his head and then seeing the zombies oh just give me more of that give me all of that that yes. was amazing did you buy the the marvel legends mysterio figure when the, it came out for the movie, no. Yeah. I'm I did get the uh, I did get the Funko though. Yes, yeah, I remember seeing the Funko. That would have been a nice action figure to get that Mysterio one. So that was number six, Far From Home, with sixty nine points. Ryan, can you guess what number five was with sixty six points? This time I'm going to go with it. Guardians, the first one. Incorrect. Once again. Damn it. I don't know. I'm sorry. How does Guardians rank that high? That's a little... Uh, Guardians ranked pretty weird. high. The answer I was looking for was Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Oh, that was like... Oh, man. Actually, on my list, I had a really hard time trying to keep that pretty high only because of all the newer movies that have come out. Mm -hmm. But that's such a good... That just goes to show you, like, again, when you find the right director and how it transforms the whole brand. Like... The Russos really changed the way we looked at Marvel films, all for the better. Like, it was, uh, not only was it what people would want in terms of a gritty, dark, and tragic grounded story, <laughs> but it was still fun, comic booky. It was a fun, comic booky soap opera with action, it is a political soap opera. It was amazing. I'm all for it. Space operas, give it to me. Political action thriller operas let's go like yes right and great evolution of captain america they show the evolution of captain america they put him in a period piece to go this is how cheesy he was then they move him into today's world and show him how he would have evolved brilliant that's how you do it i um, mean i'm a big fan of 1970s political uh paranoia thrillers like movies like the conversation and the parallax view and I've never read a 1970s Captain America comic. I imagine they're very similar in tone. So I think that they cracked this beautifully. And then to top it all off, casting an actor who was huge at the time, like, um, oh my God, why am I blanking on his name? The Sundance Kid. What's wrong with me? I'm so sorry. Robert Redford, dude. Thank you. Oh my <laughs> God. It's been a long week. Uh, casting somebody like Robert Redford as the villain is just the icing on that cake. Uh, and then to top it all off, we have a movie that looks and feels like The Empire Strikes Back because it ends on this cliffhanger and it's got the set design that still feels like it. I love The Winter Soldier so much. This is a perfect place for it, though. Number five. Number four, with 62 points. Now we can talk about it, Ryan. It's Guardians of the Galaxy, volume one. This is classic Marvel formula in action, taking a group of characters we know very little about, no one really cared for, and yet making it pro arguably one of the biggest movies of all time. The one movie that brings in the most, I would say, the most newer fans than any other character. Uh, I remember meeting people that wanted to see Guardians with me only because they saw the trailers and it looked so much fun for them, and they were not Marvel fans to begin with. Right. It's, it did so much for those characters. Like, if not for that movie, we wouldn't have had that Xbox game that came out last year, right? We, I would not have that box sitting in my room of Marvel United Guardians of the Galaxy Remix because nobody would care about those, even though that, that board game does a good job of throwing out characters that you never expected. Like, you can play as Dupe 
for God's sake. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, absolutely. Where, but like the, they put guardians on the map and now they are a mainstay. They're a Marvel mainstay. And it's a beautiful film. And yeah. I think it deserves that spot. So that got 62 points. And the next movie, now we're in the top three. What a big jump from 62. The next movie got 41. Points. Okay. Now, the top three, I think we expected these three movies to be here. Uh, the order in which they ended up surprised me. Okay. Uh, what do you think cracked number three? So do you know what's left? Do you know the three that are left? I have an idea of what's left. Um... So, Let me just check my list here. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, this is number three? Yeah. I I'm going to say Avengers Infinity War. That's right. That's exactly what's number three. Avengers Infinity War with 41 hey. points. Uh, big jump from 62, which means a lot of people were loving Infinity War. This was my number one last year. Uh, this year changed. Yeah. Um, but Infinity War is... Talk about taking the event that is Avengers 1 and saying, you thought that was an event? Here you go. Yeah. Uh, I will never forget watching this movie for the first time. Never. I will never forget what it left the audience with at the end of the movie. The, I've never felt so much of, that's it? Like not in a bad way. Like it can't end there. That's what every. That's the whole feeling of fear. It could not end there, and it did. And it left people. I can't remember for how long, but it felt like forever. I think a year. I think pretty much one solid year. I'm doing a video essay for my channel right now about cliffhanger endings um, because I just saw Avatar two and it was great. But uh, oh. this cliffhanger ending in Infinity War. Cliffhangers are some of my favorite things that movies do when they do them right. And this was everything I could want out of that. Yeah. 100%. Couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah. Just wow. Just wow. Do you want to go to the sandwich? Yes, please. Me too, please. And Fantasia would like one as well. <laughs> and I'll, I'll get it on Uber Eats. You can Uber <laughs> Eats more sandwich to me. <laughs> Yeah, I, as long as you give me a good tip to Uber Eats it to you, buddy, I'll, I'll gladly drive it over for you. Well, I live in Brampton, and if working for Uber Eats has taught me anything, it's that people in Brampton don't tip. So, sorry, <laughs> I got how bad by the rules. So that was Avengers Infinity War with 41 points at number three. Now we make an even bigger jump with 23 points at number two, Avengers Endgame. Of course. Naturally. They'd be side by side as they as they should be. Um, I is I think all I can say with that movie is the time jump. It does such a good job of still giving you, even though it does a five year time jump after the beginning of the movie, and the movie makes you really sit with consequences and uh, and how these characters have to live with it. And it's so good. Oh man! And who's the who? Uh, who um, Who'd have thought that uh, Ant Man would be the one to trigger how to, to save the whole thing, which is really interesting. Right, the smallest person can make a difference. That's what J.R.R. Tolkien taught me. Wow, mm -hmm. way to phrase that one. Smallest <laughs> person can make the difference. Oh, that's cute. This is what ended up as my number one this year because finally having uh, seen it again right after Infinity War, it's such a special movie and. Hollywood has proven one thing that the only thing it's Hollywood is really bad at starting new franchises because it's too scared to do that. But yeah. the only thing that it's worse at is ending pre-existing ones. Yes. And even though Endgame is obviously not an end to the Marvel franchise, it is an end to a very big and very important and very popular story. Mm -hmm. And it's real hard to do that well. The same year that Endgame came out, we also saw the end of the X-Men story, of the Game of Thrones story, and of the Star Wars story. And none of those are something people are writing home about. Okay? <laughs> yeah. All right? 
Nobody's like, dear mom, I am fine, having a wonderful time. My God, Dark Phoenix was the most satisfying thing ever, right? That There's no letter that says that. Um, Endgame, though, I mean, all I go back to is, is Steve dancing with Peggy, and I'm just like, there is no ending more perfect than this to the Infinity Saga. There is yep. no ending more perfect than that. And yep. the, the beautiful tribute to Tony Stark at the end, it's just... Last year, Infinity War was my favorite because I was still reeling from how bombastic and wonderful it is. And then along comes Avengers Endgame, which is even more emotional. And that's why it had to be my number one. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Which means we all know what number one is. And it beat Avengers Endgame by one point. Wow. It got 22 points. You guessed that the top film would get between 10 and 12. It was a bit, uh, it was much closer than it was with the Disney Plus shows. Spider-Man No Way Home, the third Tom Holland outing, which my mom hasn't seen yet, so I got to be real careful what I say for spoilers here, (laughs) is the number one ranked Marvel movie from the group of folks we polled with 22 points. Uh, well, I will cover most of the spoilers for you because you got your headphones on. So, thank you. Uh, but the this movie had so many delightful surprises that it just couldn't be talked like so many moments that will like there's no movie in at least the next few years could ever do what this movie did for not only you know the character. But for like generational movies, like the fact, the fact that they had Tobey Maguire and <laughs> Andrew Garfield and, and Tom Holland all in this movie together and representing the different generations in this event where you actually like deal with these villains all from past generations as well. And you kind of give them new angles and new stories to it. <sighs> You, there's no way anyone will ever be able to recreate something like this ever again. No, and I'm sure they're going to try because the multiverse saga is still going strong and we have not seen the last of that kind of thing. Um, even with DC, which is having a lot of shakeups right now, but DC's bread and butter is this, uh, particularly when you play around in the world of The Flash. So... I'm real curious to see how DC handles this, especially now that somebody has done it first, right? Marvel has now done it first, even though this is DC's thing. Yeah. Um, and I am, I, I think we can all bet our bottom dollars that we are going to see more of this in the MCU too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we already kind of did a multiverse of madness, but the, the idea of this being pulled off notwithstanding obviously it's just a generational treasure that we can't believe we're seeing it when it happens uh but if you take all of that away ryan you take away what this movie gives us and who it gives us and you take away the villains and how they interact with spider-man you take all that away you still have a beautiful powerful and a real heartbreaking spider-man story that plays to the strength of the character where he's just, you know, beset with misfortune at every turn, but he just keeps going and giving it his all and keeps doing the right thing. And that's why we admire him. And that's why he's our hero. Uh, And this movie is Spider-Man doing something for, you know, doing something that would benefit him. And every time he does that, it backfires. And then we have to watch him pull himself back up. And that's one of the many reasons why we love this character. And it does that better than any movie in this trilogy has done it, maybe better than any Spider-Man movie has ever done it. So it's it's not quite as much a celebration of all things Spider-Man as something like Into the Spider-Verse, but it comes real damn close. Absolutely. I I couldn't say consider it better myself. Um it's just something, it's 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 a historical movie. You know, you think you think the Avengers assembling would be like the biggest thing, and then in comes Marvel Studios on. And this movie is historical on a number of reasons, um, bringing in older Spider-Man, bringing in older villains, 
But on top of that, Sony and Marvel working together. Uh, that's monumental, uh, right? Like all these little things uh, to make this historical movie that could never in, in, in no time soon could ever be duplicated. Like not, no. cannot be duplicated. It's, it's impossible. And, and I, I, yeah. Sorry. No, I, yeah. There, I, I, I just can't even really finish it with words. <laughs> kind of left speechless. Of, like even, even sprinkling in Daredevil. Right. Jeez. I forgot about that. Yeah. And that's what's crazy about it. It's like that movie's still filled with monumental moments that you forget that they threw in Daredevil, and no one was expecting that. Like people were kind of thinking it was gonna like. Sorry, to, to say no one was expecting it is kind of not true, but. But no one believed that it could actually happen. No, nobody believed that. Um, and uh, it, it finally happened. It gave us what we what we wanted and more. Um, I think a ghost just pulled my mouse right off my desk because I wasn't yeah. touching it, and yet it fell off. Um, I think that the the biggest takeaway we can take away from Spider Man No Way Home is that just like how. We love Werewolf by Night because without outright saying it, it promises to give us the world that it's, it's steeped us in. I think Spider-Man No Way Home, without saying so, is very clearly telling us, the fans, you are getting more Morbius. And at the end of the day, that's what's important. Um, please comment on that while I retrieve my mouse from under the desk. I got to remove yeah. my headphones for one second. Take it away. God damn Morbius. Uh, still haven't seen it. Still haven't watched it. Um, and uh, yeah, Morbius. Here's the thing. I, they could definitely add more. <laughs> ah! uh, with Morbius. All I can say with about, about, about Morbius is it's good that they explored it. They explored it. But to, to the fact that they think that all the memes made around Morbius defines its success is a really sad, sad thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, Sony, I think Sony has the right idea of focusing on villains and making villain stories. Um, but yeah, it's just, mm, it's weird. It's weird. I was I busy. Uh, you, left me, you left me in a weird spot, like leaving me on a Morbius hook, but... I was busy getting my mouse, so I didn't hear most of what you said, but I'm going to assume it was you saying Morbius is your all-time favorite Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, even though it's not a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. And you just wish Kevin I Feige will, to this day, to this day and many days ahead, I will forever say that that movie is... People have told me to my face that it is, and I'm like, it is not. You cannot. Just because, just because the vulture is in the end doesn't mean that the worlds are coming together. And copy pasted into the end with with Jared Leto responding with, to things that aren't even being said to him. <laughs> uh, but that's a that's a horse of a different color. Uh, but that has been ranking Marvel 2022, everybody. According to the seven people we pulled, WandaVision is the best show, and Spider Man No Way Home is the best film. Uh, next year, hopefully, we'll pull even more people and get even more thoughts on uh, and we'll have more movies and shows under our belt by then but uh, i think this turned out pretty good ryan what do you think i think it turned out really good uh kind of not surprised with the results uh not not too too surprised there there are some creative curveballs for sure but mm -hmm. not too surprised with where certain ones landed um yeah like spider-man no way home i was i was not surprised by that i i think it ranked pretty high just because of what it, this what it accomplished. Yeah, I figured it would rank high. I didn't think it would beat Endgame. That surprised me. I'm really looking forward to watching things like Incredible Hulk and um, Eternals rise as time. Eternals, but Eternals probably not, depending on depending on how certain things play out. I, but it it would take a lot, dude. It would take a lot for Eternals to rise. It would take a lot. Thankfully, though, we met like 45 new characters in that movie. So we're going to see some of them again. And I think that's going to change some hearts and minds. But until that happens, it's stuck here in the last place, just like me at the FIFA World Cup. When uh, I told Argentina, look, I can help you out. I'm wearing your colors. Let me on the field. And they said no. And look what happened. <laughs> they won. Yeah. Anyways, sir, 
thank you for ranking Marvel with me. Thank you for having me. What a year it's been. We got a whole other year to look forward to of Marvel stuff. And on top of that, other stuff, lots of Star Wars stuff happening next year. Um, and just another wonderful year of film and, and TV in general to look forward to. So hopefully all of you will be there with us when we talk about that. Until then, that has been Ranking Marvel. That has been Infinity Rewatch. Ryan, where can the good people find you? As always, you can find me on my Instagram page. That's probably where I'm going to be if I if I start. I've been really behind on my social media stuff, to be honest with you. Uh, but yes, you can find me on there at Ryan J Whitehead, and you find me on Twitter at Crusader Online. Um, if you tag me, I will I will respond. And uh, <laughs> but streaming wise, you can find me on Twitch.tv forward slash Xbox Canada, and you can find me on our YouTube channel at YouTube.com forward slash Expert Zone. Please support our content. Expert Zone. I've always liked that name. It sounds cool. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Andrew Fantasia. And uh, then you can find me on my YouTube channel, the Andrew Fantasia YouTube channel, where I have a video coming out uh, within a while. I'm still writing it and stuff uh, on Avatar, the way of water, because hot damn, that is some sexy water, Ryan. I don't know if you've seen Avatar yet, but you I haven't seen it. should because it is good. Uh, <laughs> it is worth it the wait uh it might be my 14th favorite marvel movie so there's that wow all right until next time everybody please have a marvelous day